Okay, I've mostly been avoiding this subject, but it's time this channel finally talked about housing. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation, although transportation is a bit tangential today. And I do get a ton of comments and messages asking me to talk about this or that aspect of housing, density, affordability, gentrification, displacement, land value tax. Believe me, it never ends. And I've admittedly been avoiding this topic, partly because it's just a freaking minefield, but also partly because the subject is just so complex and multifaceted that I've really struggled with how to carve off a discrete part that I can turn into a sarcastic 12 to 15 minute YouTube video. Kind of makes me want to avoid the subject altogether, but what I can't get away from is that for people who want to live in walkable, transit-rich cities with tons of opportunity, and I feel like there are a growing number of us, it's not that much of a reach to say housing affordability is the defining issue of our time. So there are a lot of different directions I can go as far as a video topic for today, but I think the best place to start is just for me personally, as someone who has owned different kinds of homes in a high demand coastal city, and as a YouTuber of modest trustworthiness, how I think about housing as an expense and or as an investment. And as always, I'll bring data to the discussion so you can chew it over. Disclaimer though, housing economics is not my professional wheelhouse. I don't claim any special expertise here beyond being someone with a planning background who's spent their whole life in expensive West Coast cities. And honestly, the thing that really pushed me into doing this was somebody forwarded me this web article, Higher Urban Densities Associated with the Worst Housing Affordability, with the idea that I was supposed to react to it somehow. Well, I don't remember who sent it, but I guess now you're getting your reaction. So the article does some extremely basic analysis of American community survey data to show that, huge shocker, Housing prices are higher in metro areas that have higher densities. But then they imply that what it's showing is that instead of increased densities helping to mitigate housing affordability issues, it just makes everything more expensive. As far as I can tell, there's nothing wrong with the math itself, just the interpretation. I mean, yeah, housing is more expensive in cities that have higher density, but the article almost certainly gets the causality backwards. There's more density in those cities because there's more demand to live in them with higher willingness to pay, which means multifamily developments are a lot more likely to pencil out. The article really just promotes the whole narrative of new construction being luxury housing and people who support building more market rate housing being developer shills or whatever. And it's the type of baldly dishonest thing libertarian think tanks love to crank out hoping and probably knowing to a certain extent that people won't apply enough critical thinking to see why it's nonsense. Sorry, that was kind of a side rant. What I really want to talk about today is how we think about home ownership in America, and in particular, how we think about it as an investment. By the way, disclaimer, I have no intention of turning this into a personal finance channel. Although, if you watched my cost of car ownership video, you could be forgiven for thinking otherwise. So let's start with the conventional wisdom that buying a house is a good investment. And let's recognize that taking on a mortgage and building home equity is a very typical path to building wealth. And for a large number of US households, home equity is an overwhelmingly large part of their net worth. And you have to have a place to live regardless, so why not have at least part of your monthly payment going toward building equity instead of just giving it all to a landlord? It's just not that straightforward though. There are a ton of variables to consider when you're thinking about whether to own or whether to rent. For one thing, it's not a passive investment. There's constant maintenance and upkeep money, and maybe worse, time that you have to spend on repairs, renovations, yard work. 
Ugh. There's mortgage interest that's gonna depend on what the rates were when you bought, and there are property taxes and insurance that are gonna vary by where you live. And maybe the biggest thing is you don't know when you're gonna want to or have to sell. Life is unpredictable. Career changes, relationship changes, needing to be closer to family needing to be a lot further away from family. It's hard to anticipate any of these things and that's probably what makes home buying such a fraught decision. As an investment, it's really hard to say what the rate of return is on a home. You can look at data from the Fed and see that over time, the average sale price of a house has seen about a five to 6% compound annual growth rate, which is better than inflation over the same period, but worse than the stock market. It's not even that simple though. Keep in mind, houses today aren't what they were in the early 1960s. The average size of a new home back then was closer to a thousand square feet and the average size of a new home today is more like 2,500 square feet. So between all the variables and the apples to oranges nature of the data, it's hard to say what kind of return you should expect from a home, maybe two to five percent per year. But the other thing is the housing market is volatile. Let's go back to that Fred chart. If you bought your house in 2007 and then for whatever reason you had to sell in the next five years, life being unpredictable, you most certainly did not get two to 5% in annual returns. The other piece is a home is not very liquid and there's a pretty big transaction cost. You can't go on a website and click sell like you would with some shares from an index fund. There's a lot of work involved prepping a place for sale and there are a whole bunch of closing costs and commissions that eat into your returns. Look, what I'm not saying here is that owning a home is a bad idea. Having your own place is rewarding in a lot of non-monetary ways. Fixing up a place exactly the way you want it can be, for example, very psychologically rewarding. I mean, it is deeply liberating to be able to paint rooms chartreuse if you want. So the best advice I've seen on this is to think of your home as an expense first and an asset that contributes to your net worth, if you're lucky, second. Okay, I'm sure you could tell I have mixed feelings about all this. And what I wanna do next is talk about why the idea of a dwelling unit as an investment can be corrosive to society, especially in the time we're living through right now. And to do that, I am gonna take a closer look at some more recent data. But before I get there, brief reminder to drop a like on the video and consider subscribing if you're interested in weekly content on like whatever urbanism or transportation related topic I got interested in that week. Social media, I'm actually more active on Instagram right now than anything else for what it's worth. Patreon link is always down in the description if you're interested in supporting the channel directly, which is always appreciated. So let's get a little more current and look at a time frame we're gonna be more familiar with, which is the housing market since the beginning of the millennium. Maybe a bit arbitrary, but there's a reason, which is the monthly data Zillow publishes for its Home Value Index, or ZHVI, only goes back to January 31st of 2000. But that does give us a 20 plus year span where we've had some really significant ups and downs in the economy. And ZHVI lets us drill down into specific cities and housing types, so that's what we're gonna do. One thing here is you can see the same strong uptick at the onset of the pandemic that you saw in the FRED data. I'm sure there are a lot of theories about this, but I think commercial slash office real estate got a lot less valuable and space in the home became much more of a premium for a lot of people. But there's been a dip in the last few months, so who knows? There are so many factors that go into things like this. Anyway, what's really interesting to me is when you peel it apart into single family houses and condos slash co-ops, which ZHVI does let you do. And the numbers do back up the conventional wisdom, which is that on average, a detached single family house appreciates faster than a multifamily dwelling unit. 
I think this is really important and I'm gonna come back to why. But first, let's talk about what might make detached single family homes appreciate faster than multifamily. I mean, it's understandable why they'd be priced lower in the first place. They're usually smaller and people might not like having a homeowners association and an HOA generally does come with the territory. But here's another theory. If you've ever owned a house, your property tax bill probably contains separate assessed values for the structure and for the land it sits on. If you own a condo, those values might be rolled together or they could be separate, say if you own an attached townhouse, but either way, the land piece of the assessed value is gonna be proportionately much smaller for a condo than it would be for a detached single family house. And here's the thing, just like a car is a depreciating asset, a residential structure is also a depreciating asset, although maybe a bit slower. They deteriorate over time and eventually they get replaced. Land, on the other hand, is not a depreciating asset. It's a resource which, by definition, has a fixed supply. And pretty basic economic theory says if supply of a good is fixed but demand is constantly increasing, you get higher prices. So if there's an investment part of buying a house, it's really that land component. And because the land component of a single family house is proportionally higher than it is for a condo, houses are usually going to be a better investment value. This is no small thing because I think it really goes to the heart of what is probably the biggest issue in urbanism, which is we've got a growing number of people who want to live in a relatively small number of walkable, transit-rich U.S. cities. So how do we build more housing and more density in these places where we've got the biggest affordability problems? The fact that single family houses have this advantage in investment value and that value is such a big part of a lot of people's net worth, especially in coastal cities, creates a huge problem. Let's go back to Econ 101. When supply goes up, prices go down. So if you own a home, at least from the perspective of your personal balance sheet, it's in your financial interest for there to be as few new homes as possible. Really, what we're talking about here is an ethical question and a political one. How do people balance their personal financial interests against what's socially just? Different people answer this question differently. That's called living in a society. The way I answer it is I'm renting a smaller apartment partly because I'm a bit itinerant right now, but partly as a values decision, kind of in the same way you can take an ethical approach to investing in the stock market by investing in companies that are socially and environmentally responsible. You can approach the home ownership decision the same way. You can buy or rent a place that's aligned with the way you wanna live, even if it doesn't have quite the anticipated ROI that a detached single family house would. Or honestly, go ahead and buy the single family home, but don't close the door behind you and become the person that opposes new housing at every turn. This really isn't the type of thing that tends to solve itself by depending on individuals to do the right thing though. So as far as effective market interventions, I'm gonna save that for a future episode because it's just too much to get into right now. But leave me your favorite silver bullets and theories down in the comments. And that is all I got. Thanks for joining today and thanks to the patrons for keeping me busy adding new pages to the credits I have to roll every week. The support does make it feasible for me to keep doing this for the foreseeable future. And running out of topic ideas isn't going to be a problem anytime soon, I don't think. I am always on the lookout for good ones though, so keep them coming. I'll be back with a new episode next week and I'll see you then.